Well, Isha, thank you so much for hanging out with me today on the podcast. I thought that we might start with just talking about the rental landscape overall. You guys just released some new data that might show that the rental market is cooling a little. What can you tell me about that? Yeah, so obviously real estate is hyper local and uh, yeah. not all markets were created equal, but we have seen kind of a very big dip in April in demand when everybody was trying to figure out what's going on and what to do. And uh, then May, June, July, we kind of, May and, May and June specifically, we've seen a climb in demand and, um, and a lot of activity. People were kind of moving around. I think in, in July, what the data shows, at least in the fine markets we've tracked, is that there is a little bit of a pause. And depending on the market, it happens for different reasons. So for example, Boston, where we're based, it's a heavy college town. So mm -hmm. a lot of the leases get signed for September 1st. A lot of the college students are, as it turns out, not gonna be coming back to the city. And a lot of the students mm -hmm. that can come back to the city, actually we're seeing them taking a gap year just because mm -hmm. they really wanna experience college properly. So yeah, yeah. they decide to take it off. And I've heard that a lot. And, uh, and that's impacting the rental market here, but kind of, in the five markets we've looked at, I think it was Atlanta and, uh, and Tampa. There is a little bit of a lull and we've kind of flattened out a little bit in, uh, in July. I do expect that to, to pick up though in the fall. I think it's yeah. a temporary pause. It's just interesting, you know, we think about COVID in, in so many different facets in terms of the pandemic's impact on housing, but to think now through, okay, what happens with the schools and how that impacts both rentals and residential and it, you know, it, it's the gift that keeps on giving in terms of as we peel the layers back, but I yeah, think we'll and, see and more of that the in the fall. Sorry, you, you also have the financial stimulus that's expiring. Right, right, so yeah. So there's a lot of talk, certainly in the media, I don't know if that materialized in all the key rental markets about, you know, people getting into rent defaults and uh, the moratorium on evictions expiring. So I think people still now kind of want to see what is the government going to do, you know, what what is my job? What does my job life look like? My professional life look like when the kids go back in school? Do I need a three bedroom? Do I need a two bedroom? So it kind of makes sense to me that the end of the summer has been slower. Yeah, yeah. It is interesting though, because that's uh, the antithesis of what's happening in the resale market. The resale market is on fire to the extent that there's uh, capacity available of which, which is shrinking every day. But it, it is kind of, there's sort of a shift there where people are still willing to make those permanent investments, but they're just, um, you know, there, there's angst over maybe the rental market where there's more fluidity generally. Does that, does that ring true for you? I think so. I think on the resale market, there's been just a lot of pent up demand. So if you're kind of dead set and you decided you're going to buy a place, you've been basically sitting and on the sideline yeah. for a little while. And, uh, and then once you go back into the market, there's so little supply in most markets, just not enough houses for sale, especially in that entry level, first time home buyer, uh, mid-market call it I think there's a ton on or, or a good amount in the luxury side but kind of everything else you're just competing and there's a big bidding war so it doesn't surprise me that it's, uh, it's been pretty hot yeah yeah so you have a background as an agent also as a working agent and broker side as well what do you feel like agents miss the mark when it comes to the rental business it, it seems like there it's sort of an afterthought for so many of them but there's a lot of money to be made and there's a lot of people to serve on that side of our business yeah i, I honestly i mean first of all i've always had rentals as part of my own personal portfolio as an agent and as a managing broker and mm -hmm. I always felt that my job description, if there was one on, on my uh, signature, on my uh, business card would be, my job is to help people find a place to live. And if I am unable to help 50, 60% of the population find a place to live, I'm really limiting my ability to expand my sphere. So, so that's always been my philosophy. I think it comes into an even bigger focus in the past few years and into the future because of all the demographic changes we're seeing on the sales side. So if you realize that the largest group of home buyers are these millennials and Gen Zs, and they're going to be driving the sales business for the foreseeable future, you have to understand that same group of people represent 65% or so of the rental population. And that in general, the way they're made up is their, their propensity to rent is just significantly higher than any prior generation. So 
I think that everything from the MLSs to the brokerage to the individual agent level, rentals are going to have to become an important pillar and part of the strategy. And it's really been my life's mission over the past 10 years or so to, to help agents take advantage of it. And so I, I don't know if agents have missed the mark. I just think that it's been very difficult for agents to take advantage and to properly help renters given the tools that existed or that exist in the world prior to, to kind of what we, we decided to build. Yeah. So for you, you're saying it's more of, it's, it's an issue of access. Have they been able to properly access that, that side of the market and do it so with tools that enable them to be successful? And so how, how is Rental Beast helping them be successful on that front? Well, on the most basic level, when, when you try and help some, find some, somebody a place to live, you have to figure out what's actually available for them, you know, just like on the for sale side, right? Yeah, so, in theory, that's a good way to start. But. That's a good way to start. So on the MLS, you have access to almost everything that's available to be purchased, but most MLSs either don't cover rentals or have relatively a very small portion of the rental market available through them. So what Rental Beast has done over the past decade is build a rental MLS. So our goal is everywhere we exist, we try and gain access to 100% of all the available rental inventory. And it's a monumental task. It's just very, very difficult to find all Tedious, these small Tedious, I would think. Yeah. yeah, small mom and pop landlords. I was just on the phone with, uh, with a very big group in New York. And just even though it's a big city and it's a vertical market, you still have a ton of small owners that own a condo here an apartment there, and certainly in a market like Austin, huge rental market, a ton of smaller landlords, almost 80% of the inventory is in the hands of smaller property managers and owners. So finding all that inventory and, um, and then even harder than finding all this inventory is actually maintaining it. Yeah. Uh, because the, the big difference between for sale and for rent is that the for sale market, properties tend to stay on the market for at least a day or two or a week or a month. Um, on the rental market, sometimes it counted in hours. So, uh, so it took us a while to figure out how to do that. And we've aggregated now nearly 9 million of these properties and, uh, and on track to have 13 to 14 million properties by the end of this year. So that's, that's at the core of everything we do is finding access to the inventory and giving that access to agents. And then, so what does it look like when you partner with MLSs to help uh, allow um, access to the tools for agents in, that, in those markets? What, what's, what is your MRED partnership like? Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll speak to MRED specifically and, and MLS in general. So when somebody wants to sell a home in Austin, for example, they don't sit there and think, should I or shouldn't I put my property into the MLS? It's like a given, right? Like your property has to find its way into the MLS if you want it to be sold. And when we partner with an MLS, we, we effectively try and create the same ecosystem on the rental side. So if mm -hmm. any rental inventory that exists out there, we want that to find it into the MLS. So how do you do that? So there is two distinct or three distinct integration points. Number one is how does listing, how do listings, how does information flow into the MLS? Mm -hmm. I know that um, the data dictionary on the sales side is something that's been talked a lot about over the past few years. The data dictionary on rentals is very different. So for example, on every rental property, you need to have a moving date because if you're working with a tenant that needs to move on September 1st, you only want to see properties that are available on their date. On the sales side, there's no concept of a moving date. Mm -hmm. um, pets. If you buy a property, nobody cares what pets you have. If you're renting, yeah. every property in the country has very specific pet policy. We, in the data report you just mentioned, there are insane movements on rental concessions almost daily. So landlords are offering everything from one to three, three months rent to prospective tenants. More important than all of that is the compensation that's being offered to agents yeah. on rentals. So... When we integrate with the MLS's property, every time somebody wants to put in a listing, we capture the proper data dictionary from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of the integration is the ability to search through these listings properly. Again, search by pet policy, search by data availability, search by concessions, search by amenities that are special to rentals or parking, parking terms and so on and so forth. And then the second thing that has to be unique in order to ingest all this data is you got to have a value proposition to the community that makes sense for them. You can't just say, hey, you come put your stuff into the MLS. Why? Why should I? Right? So we've built an outgoing syndication engines. We're providing the community with tools like the ability to screen tenants, which is kind of how we started with Embraid is 
how do we make it easier for agents to actually close rental transactions if they're already in that business quickly? I know there's a very sexy word now, virtually without having to push paper around and produce a credit report, background check, eviction history, and make sure that the right information moves between the landlord, the agent, and the tenant or tenants uh, seamlessly while everybody stays compliant with the Fair Credit Reporting Act. At signing the lease online, conducting virtual tourings online. Um, we just so really just modern. You're really just modernizing the rental transaction from end to end. And that, to your point, you know, this has been possible before, but people haven't built out the tools to make it flow in that way in such a way that it's been accessible. Mm-hmm. And that makes sense. The the compliance issues on the on the background checks and the, the you know managing tenant interactions too has really grown complex. So I can imagine that having a tool, build, managing a tool like yours requires a lot of oversight on that front as well. Um, and some yeah, of that is market yeah. specific, is it not? Yeah, sometimes it's within markets. So yeah. Emirate happens to be in a state where in Cook County, which is only one county in the universe that they service, there is different rules than the rest of the, the area. So yeah, absolutely, it's very market specific. Yeah. What do you think we're going to see on the investment front in the rental market? You know, I think um, as I'm thinking about people having watched their their other investments um, just evolve so drastically through the recession in reaction, markets reaction to the pandemic, of course, do you think that they're looking at housing as a different type of investment now? Is it, do you think that we'll see a, a higher level of investment in rental housing? Are you asking from the institutional investor level or the mom and pop? Uh, both. Give me both. And tell me the differences between them. Well, the institutional In terms of how they approach. Yeah. So the institutional investors have a lot of money on the sidelines and they're being very aggressive. So mm-hmm. the only thing stopping somebody like, um, I don't know, Invitation Homes or Progressive or, um, you know, all, all these big portfolios, on Amherst, is not the lack of capital. They have a lot of capital and they're ready to acquire they're, they're probably suffering from the same thing that traditional buyer is suffering from, which is there's just not a lot of supply. But mm-hmm. they have all kinds of algorithm and computers and machine learning looking and sifting through MLSs and everything else that they can get their hands on to figure out, is this property a house I can buy and make a good return on and turn it and convert it into a rental, a single family rental? Mm-hmm. So, so they are very active um, and they will remain very active, I think, because the the demand curve, um, we still need, I think, 30 million new rental units by 2030 just to keep up with demand. Yeah, um, the demand curve on both uh, resale and rental is just insane. And that is the thing that keeps our markets chugging along. It's a scary thing, too, when we look at the amount of capacity we have to serve. It, it, you know, We're going to have to make bigger investments in providing for more capacity at some point. What, what, did, what do agents need to know that they don't know today? Well, by far, the biggest one is that they're... It, it's a pain. It takes a long time and, it, and you don't make a lot of money. Yeah. 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 All, the low return on risk. Yeah. All of, all of these things are true unless you have the right tools. So it's true. If you don't have the inventory and you don't have tools to close these transactions or to generate leads or to vet leads, you are going to be spending a ton of money for very little return. However, if you do have access to all the right inventory and you can generate leads pretty easily and you can close transactions online, there is about $12 billion in leasing commissions available annually to agents. Um, and you know, I, I know that our system was geared towards allowing an agent to literally sit at home, especially now during COVID and without even leaving their couch, be able to generate leads and close yeah. transactions and get paid commissions. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so I think that's, to me, if, if I had that tool when I was starting out, that'd been a big deal. Yeah. And the second thing I think agents need to realize if they don't already is that a lot of them think renters are renting because they can't afford or they're not qualified to buy. And that mm-hmm. hasn't been the case in a really long time. So the affluency of the rental population has grown tremendously over the past 10 years. And there is a study that I cite that's from the uh, Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard 10 year study, 2010 to 2020. And we, they've tracked about 160% increase in rental households making more than 150K, 26% increase in renters that are married and almost a 40% increase in renters that are over, over 30. 
And it goes to the, to the point of millennials are choosing to rent. It's mm -hmm. not a de default because they can't afford to buy. They're just making that choice. And a lot of them are on the fence and a lot of them are interested in buying. About five of eight millennials are going to be buying in the next five, um, sorry, 36 months. So you need to tap into that in order to build your network, in order to build your sphere of influence. And these are highly qualified buyers. Instead of buying them when you're competing against thousands of agents when they're ready to buy, build a relationship with them when they're renting and get paid a rental commission. I mean, that's, that's what yeah. we're trying to facilitate. Yeah, I do. I think you're speaking to the agent as an advisor and an advisor that sticks with that consumer over the lifetime of their, of their needs, which is it, that is an appropriate space for agents to be in. And I think when they think of themselves that way, they think of themselves as finding the house in whatever shape or form it comes in, they'll, they'll be served well in terms of the business that that generates for them. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. It's fun to hear what Rental Beast is doing. Um, I, your tool is very impressive. I know that it's going to help enable access to the rental market for agents that use it properly. So thanks for hanging out and for doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Emily.